来演。Very, very glad that you are here and gathered together. What we're about to do is to worship our still speaking, as we like to say around here, and that surely must mean still listening to God. So welcome to First United Church of Christ and Conference Center Second Life. We are an actual church with full real life standing in the Eastern Association, Southern California, Nevada Conference of the UCC. Now you will see, uh, in addition to myself, one other person here this evening with a, a tag that includes the words First UCC and Minister. Pastor Chris and I are both ordained UCC clergy in real life, as is our uh, other minister here, uh, Pastor Josh. 
Uh, you're going to run into some folks also with a tag that says guide. If you are not familiar with our campus, we have two full regions here. I want you to think Usher in real life. Uh, the guides will help you find your way around, okay? Uh, and many of them really love to give tours, so don't hesitate to ask. Uh, of course, our staff folk uh, like Doug and uh, Marie, who is still convalescing, bless her heart, uh, keep the rest of us organized and handle all sorts of things like our special events and that sort of thing. Now, as a United Church of Christ Church, we are dead serious and mean it when we say no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Uh, you're always welcome to uh, send your friends a teleport taxi to come worship or socialize. That is how churches grow. Well, virtual reality churches, at least. And how we have grown in over six years now as the UCC ministry in Second Life. If you would like a bulletin for the service, uh, just touch that red book. It's on the stand right near the sanctuary entrance, and it will offer you one. Uh, if you would like to become an official member of this church, that's really simple to do. Will you let any clergy or staff member know that you would like to do that? Now, this church is connected to the wider church and the whole world. We support the wonderful work of the UCC with our prayers, and we do so financially as well. All of our churches do that if you'd like to help. There's a donation bowl at the rear of the sanctuary. That's our regular donation bowl. But you're also going to notice a special offering bowl here in front of the sanctuary this evening. Our Real Life Board of Directors has decided that First UCC Second Life will be what is called a 5 for 5 church. And that means we will participate in the five special offerings that the United Church of Christ does each year. This evening is one of those offerings. This one is the one great hour of sharing, and you may have heard of that, even if you're not a member of a UCC church. It is a traditional offering in several denominations. And while you're considering making a special offering donation by clicking the donation bowl up front here, uh, let me uh, offer you a short video that describes just a small part of the work that that gift would support. She is from a hill tribe near Chiang Mai, Thailand. She is a survivor. It may have been sexual abuse or domestic violence. She may have been forced to work and denied the opportunity to attend school. But despite her unimaginable circumstances, she now imagines a future. <laughs> A future, finishing school, learning a trade, even going to university to earn a degree. One Great Hour of Sharing works with life-changing ministries like the New Life Center in Thailand, an organization that serves Hill Tribe minority girls and young women who are at high risk for or survivors of sexual abuse, domestic violence, and human trafficking. She is from a hill tribe near Chiang Mai, Thailand. She is a survivor. And we want to thank you for uh, your uh, consideration uh, and for any donation that you might make. Um, 
be automatically forwarded to our special offerings treasurer account, um, and it will go to help those who are far less fortunate than most of us. All right. Scripture this evening, uh, a couple of longer readings, and uh, Doug's going to do yeoman's duty and handle the both of them for us. Mr. Doug, I believe we are ready. I got to get the microphone on. Sorry about that. I had media still going for some reason. So now we're first reading will be from the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about me, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he, sac he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons passed before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all your sons you have? Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to, Samuel then went to Ramah. And that is the end of the first reading, and our second reading is from the Gospel of John. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it was still day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him, excuse me. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. 
he kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking, they kept asking him, then how are your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the, they brought to the Pharisees a man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, well, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I believe, may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. You would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and uh, thank you very much, Doug, for the uh, marathon reading. Appreciate that. Well, the story of the man born blind presents preachers with a few exegetical difficulties. But it's a wonderful story. And in typical John fashion, Jesus provides an elaboration on the story. 
but not until chapter 10. Yeah, the lectionary isn't a help either, because chapter 10 is the text for several different dates, and even across more than one year. Oh, uh, exegesis can be fun, but not to worry about any of that. I just like to let you know how hard I work sometimes. Now, I'm going to take a different look at this ancient story. But to do that, let's consider our present world. One of the reasons people become residents of Second Life is to find community, friends, kindred spirits. Much has been written in recent years about the breakdown of families, the growing isolation of people from others, and we tend to be a bit nostalgic about the good old days when family and a tight-knit community were the center of lives. Really? The text for this evening presents a very different look at the good old days. The first surprise is the community's reaction. They don't recognize the man who was born blind. I mean, the man has lived in their midst, but they still don't recognize him. Why? His identity was his blindness. The fact that he was differently abled was the only thing they saw in him. Is that how we see people who are different? Or are we able to look beyond the difference and see the person? Even in Second Life, with the masks that our avatars allow, can we glimpse the reality of the person? I think the answer is often yes particularly in community such as this very real church. There was a story of a beggar who was sitting across the street from an artist's studio. And the artist saw him and thought he would make an interesting portrait study. So from a distance, he painted the defeated man whose shoulders drooped and whose eyes were downcast and sad. And when he was finished, he took the portrait over to the beggar so he could look at it. Who's that? The beggar questioned. The painting bore a slight resemblance to himself, but in the painting before him he saw a person of dignity, with squared shoulders and bright uplifted eyes, almost handsome. He asked the artist, is that me? I don't look like that. But the artist replied, That is the person I see in you. In the midst of our Lenten journey, God doesn't see us as everyone else sees us. People around us may see us as cool, successful, or unattractive, or popular, or whatever. It doesn't matter at all how others may see us. Because you see, God sees our hearts, sees us as we really are. That's a sobering thought. So perhaps we wish we had God fooled, huh? like those we've led to believe that we're less frightened, more confident, happier than we really are. Or perhaps we're deeply grateful that God sees through all the shallow, negative judgments which so many people have placed on us. Probably it's both. There's a second surprise, and that's found in the reaction of the religious community. I should have put religious community in quotes, shouldn't I? 
Their reaction can be characterized by a reaction we encounter from those who are bent on being rigid. Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is made up. The Pharisees do not want to believe the man's story because it opposes the story they want to tell. They want Jesus to be the sinner in this story. They want another explanation, one that leaves them in control. Even in the first century, religious leaders fought for ecclesiastical control. If you get right down to it, almost everyone fails the man born blind. Even his family quickly backs away from him. We might understand the older couple, his parents being reluctant to sacrifice their homework and community for their son. But even so, wouldn't we expect them to celebrate the gift of his sight with him? There is nothing of that in this text. The parents' fear overwhelms their joy. They abandon their son to the authorities. The community fails, the religious authorities fail, the family fails. The only trustworthy figures in this story are the man born blind and Jesus. The man tells the truth, even when threatened, and the abandonment of others. Even expulsion does not deter him. Repeatedly, the man witnesses to the grace he has experienced in Jesus. Jesus is the only one he can trust. Jesus stands with the man in his final isolation. And guess what? Yeah. Jesus stands with us, too. Sometimes when I look across the sand of my backyard, most of you know I live in the Mojave Desert, I squint, sometimes because of the brightness. That kind of brightness, even from artificial light, seems dangerous to us, and we react with an automatic reflex. Metaphorically, we see this reaction unfolding in the ninth chapter of John. The light of the world shines bright. And community, religious leaders, even family, shut their eyes in self-defense. Intuitive thing to do, right? Wrong. Everything in this text is counterintuitive. The light of the world is manifest. The best thing we can do in that light is open our eyes and open them wide so that we will not be blinded by the light. And the people of God said,
Your kindness wakened me, wakened me from my sleep. Your love it beckons deeply, a call to come and die. By grace now I will come and take this life, take your life. Sin has lost its power, death has lost its sting, and from the grave you present, victory. I see there have been a lot of prayers typed into nearby chat. And uh, the fact that we're uh, starting our prayer time, that is not a signal for you to stop. Not at all. This is by far the most important thing we do here, particularly now. Because this channels God's power for transformation into Doug started this, oh, Chris started this off really with a prayer for Emmy, who I understand is uh, watching us on Facebook, and incidentally to all the folks who might be watching on Facebook Live. Especially welcome to you as well. 
Emmy, we're sending you cyber hugs, dear. All right, it was good to talk to you the other day. I spoke with Emmy on the phone. Um, but you are in our thoughts and prayers for the very best that may yet be. But you already know that. God of healing, hear our prayers. But Doug, for all of our friends in me, Marie, Emmy, Butterfly, Finn, Johnny, Laura, and anybody that he didn't happen to mention, let's just put it this way, anybody who is in need of healing, including of the emotions, huh? around this time, God of grace, hear that prayer. V with a celebration for wind that the electri electrician get his power restored tomorrow. Well, well hopefully that's going to happen. We hope that we'll celebrate power tomorrow. My goodness gracious, they don't need that in addition to everything else that's going on. With Alexis, God, please give comfort to mommy's friend Courtney, who's going home on hospice. Give comfort to her family. Alexa, I hope you don't mind if I expand that just a little bit to offer a prayer of thanksgiving for all of our first responders and for our hospice workers who perhaps are our final responders. Mm, I don't know that one. Uh, and uh, and, and my, uh, you may have just heard in the background, my uh, artificial intelligence Alexa system at all. Oh, that amuses me every time it happens. Uh, that's a generous prayer. God of grace, hear that prayer. Um, with Chantressa, all for all on the prayer list, which Doug keeps for us, and we'll be glad to give you a copy of. God of healing, hear that prayer. For all those on the front lines of the coronavirus, yeah, that's that first responder group again, isn't it, Chris? Uh, and Chris is an EMT in real life. She knows that all too well. God of grace, hear that prayer. Monica, prayers for peace amid all the chaos. Peace internationally and peace maybe even on Capitol Hill, huh, Monica? God of grace, hear that prayer with Heather. Um, aha! Heather, good to have you with us this evening. I want to let you know that Emmy's still hospitalized. Yeah, we're aware of that. Uh, so we are certainly praying for her. She sends love to all of us and is watching on Facebook. And we just sent Emmy a big greeting, too. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see. Um, so we're just, we're just grateful that Emmy could be with us. Ah, I skipped over Doug's for friend Walter, home now, but not necessarily the best thing. Yeah, people are getting... Um, Discharged from hospitals, uh, maybe a little faster than would, uh, well, maybe a lot faster than would normally be the circumstance with this pandemic uh, ramping up by the hour. So for Walter and uh, others who are at home when maybe they ought to be in another kind of care. With Shantessa, comfort to all who are mourning all of the loss of life that has happened in a span of months. And the pictures of coffins and military trucks carrying bodies away. It, I, it's hard to look at, isn't it? Um, but we do, and we go on. We are grateful for those who are taking care of final needs, while others are faced with having to mourn. Comfort them all, gracious God. Let's see, with Jose, my great uncle was placed in hospice care, stomach cancer. Lord, please grant healing and peace. Sometimes when a person goes into hospice, Jose and, and others, um, and it looks like they are in their last days, it is perfectly all right to pray for a peaceful transition into eternal life. It's not the easiest thing to pray, I will give you that. But there's nothing wrong with it. 
Um, God knows the next best thing that could happen. That's why you hear me pray so often for the very best that may yet be. With Daisy, praying that God sees us through this coronavirus and helps us all come out in one piece. Maybe Daisy with an improved world on the other side. Huh? Maybe we have some lessons that we can learn from this. We would hope so. With V, a thanksgiving for healing. Well, we can use some good news, can't we? My friend Lewis fever broke today, and he was diagnosed with COVID-19. So, looks like he's on the way to recovery. We hope that that holds, V. Certainly reason for celebration. God of grace and healing, we offer you our thanks for all who are making it through. With Mr. Doug, thankful for technology that allows us to meet here and allows my real life church, along with many live stream services and videos, that so we continue to meet together, even if not physically. I can't put it better than that. God, who offered us technology as a gift, may we use it well. Johnny wants to lift in prayer his family as he cannot be with them right now. Johnny, we're hoping that. Um, you're going to get your weight gain back and can get home real soon as well. God of grace, hear those prayers. With Aaron, please give those of us working for essential business patience, calm our fears as we can't avoid being in the community. Sally's going to be in that boat too as our wildland firefighter. Uh, calm our fears as we can't avoid being in the community. Calm our hearts as we worry about what we may be bringing home. In prayers of Thanksgiving, I was able to get a work-from-home policy written for my staff and approved so quickly so we can lessen the risk for at least some of them. God of grace, hear those who are putting themselves in harm way. Take care of the rest of us. And Jody, just your listening adds your energy for what is being prayed. So thank you for that. With Heather, uh, for everyone who is hurting emotionally from the virus isolation, as some folks are finding being cooped up uh, really, really difficult. Um, and so we hope that they find distractions, meaningful things to do, uh, people to be in touch with safely using technology, um, and that the hours do not hang too heavy. Um, and you know, there are a lot of people, Shantressa reminds us that God grants a trying time from engagements, weddings, all those kinds of things, people's plans that have just been torn to pieces. I don't know how many things I know of that I would participate in that have been canceled. But we pray that uh, the folks who are terribly disappointed will get beyond it and realize, hey, Stay in put. That's the best that can happen right now. With Doug for my son, quarantined in Michigan, praying it is only the flu. With Aaron Fremming on Facebook from my friend Carrie, who found out about cancer recurring this week, and it's in several places. Oh my goodness. That she may be comforted, comforted and healed, in other words, for the best. That may yet be. With Alexis for loving us enough to be father of us all. With Lily, prayers for Mr. Jeremy's anxiety, it's still bad. Prayers for healing for those who are sick with anything, physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, all of the aspects of health. What a nice way to put it, Lily. Really. With Shantressa for family, friends, and world comfort peace, healing, and protection from all evil, including the COVID outbreak. With Cleo, for the building I live in, and a sweet old lady, 90 years old, who has a silly granddaughter going in and out of her house without protection, and is not following the rules, somebody needs to uh, give that youngster a talking to, because she's endangering grandma big time. 
which had dressed for healing from locusts in Africa and other natural disasters. Uh, Karen, you can tell Emmy she's always welcome. We're clear for all the people who still cannot believe how serious this pandemic is because they need to understand we don't want a military state with the army controlling people. I'm sure Cleo will not mind my telling you she lives near Milan, Italy. She knows whereof she speaks. And with Heather, for my friend Carrie, who found out about the cancer this week, be comforted in Kia. Let's see. Um, John Carl, for my neighbor who was hospitalized yesterday. The second degree burns, ouch, for many who is experiencing physical discomfort and couldn't log in, but is listening in. So we're glad that you offered her the hospitality of shared computer. Thank you for that, John Carl. With the toys computer broke, where does he get it fixed? So that he's not cut off from the world, huh? Have a grace. Hear the multitude of lifted prayers. Doug, did I miss anyone? I hope not. Okay, thanks. If one got stuck, don't worry about it. No reason. Because the second you conceived of it, or even started to, God knew about it. After all, God knows when a cell divides in a hair on your head. There's no keeping any of it from God, but sometimes it's just hard to share. So somehow on the way to the keyboard, it just never gets past the elbow. No? That's all right. We still want to get energy behind those prayers that are in people's hearts and minds. So I'm going to ask you to be in silence for just a moment. You may want to scan quickly the prayers that were offered this evening. Put your energy behind them. God will receive it, and you will open yet another channel for God's transformative power. You will make a difference. Be in silence wherever you are for just a moment. And for all the prayers, unspoken, unshared, we can add an Amen. You are welcome to pray along with me if you'd like. Light, dark, we would see and yet blinded, but by what? Darkness, light, sight, sensory with our eyes, yet more, sight by heart, by spirit, divine sight, independence of physics, and yet more vital than all the senses. Gift us, Creator, with sight as you see everything perfectly, always. Amen.
If you have a favorite version of the Lord's Prayer, I invite you to pray that one. Our Father, Mother, who are in the world and surpass the world, blessed be your presence in us, in animals and flowers, in still air and wind. May justice and peace dwell among us as you come to us. Your will be our will. You will that we be sisters and brothers as bread is bread, water is itself for our hunger, for quenching of thirst. Forgive us. We walk crookedly in the world, are perverse and fail of our promise, but we would be human if only you consent to stir up our hearts. Amen. I'm extinguishing our candles now. In this place, our candlelight symbolizes spirit light. And now, of course, that light goes with each of you. Journey with that spirit company in whatever world you happen to sojourn. Oh, it could not be otherwise. No, 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 not really. Because you see, you journey just exactly as you were created to be the beloved of God. Journey well. And amen.
Thank you again, all of you, for being here. I've got to go with you in this difficult time. Um, but we're going to continue to um, hang out as community because we can do it here uh, and spend some time sort of chatting and catching up with each other. For folks who uh, are visitors here, you are especially welcome. So uh, feel free to join us. We have two nightclubs, um, Beats Fellowship Halls, huh? Um, in the building right across the way, and we're going to be in the one called Kama Cafe, all right? Um, so come on over. There are animations that will let you dance with folks, and we uh, chat and just hang out and catch up, all right? Blessings. See you over there.